Hello and welcome to a, hopefully not too long, lecture on Margaret Lucas Cavendish, uh, the Duchess of Newcastle and author of our reading this week, The Convent of Pleasure. So let's get right into it. We're going to talk about a number of things surrounding Cavendish's life, her time, and the play that we're reading. Uh, I'll discuss a little bit about her biography and her place within the intellectual tradition in Britain, specifically the female intellectual tradition. I hesitate to use the word feminism in describing the 17th century. It's a bit anachronistic, but nonetheless, these sorts of texts and works by writers like Cavendish are setting the foundation to what we'll know in the 20th century as feminism, the sort of proto-feminism that we'll see at the end of the 18th century from writers such as Mary Wollstonecraft. So the public and private sphere are important notions for you to have. Uh, we'll, of course, also talk about gender in relation to those. We'll talk about the uh, secular use of a spiritual architecture and spiritual traditions. After all, convents we normally associate with Catholic nuns, austerity, and in this case, it's a convent of pleasure, which ought to strike you as odd. We'll talk about uh, how the text constructs female retreats, female academies and academics, uh, female pleasure, and feminist utopias. Um, after all, a utopia is nowhere. It's an ideal world. So in this text, The Convent of Pleasure, Cavendish creates this possibility of this all-female world. Lesbianism, which I think we probably know, and heteronormativity may be a less familiar term. Uh, after all, it's the assumption that heterosexuality is normal. And we know that that's, of course, presumptuous. That's not so. Uh, sexual consent, in other words, saying yes enthusiastically and saying no. And political consent. These might be things that we don't think of too much, but let's remember, we just came out of, in this period, an absolute monarchy, then a lord protector who made up his own rules, and now the new king, Charles II, the son of Charles I, has to rule in conjunction with a parliament. He cannot claim to be absolute. He has to get consent. This drastically affects the culture and the politics of the writers in his court. We'll talk a bit about comedy as a genre and a little bit about the structure of the play itself. And you'll notice as you read that there are a number of plays that happen within the play. We have a presentation of the play in Act 3 and a pastoral in Act 4. So we'll talk a bit about those things. All right. So very briefly, uh, to help you out figuring this out, it was written in 1668. Uh, a woman by the name of Lady Happy Fortunate is going to use her inheritance and create a space for women to live without men interfering with them because men are the trouble of women, she points out. So men, of course, aren't able to cope with being told that they're not admitted um, and set themselves up to infiltrate the convent and mess this up in some way. Um, so that's what we've got. So you may notice a name like Lady Happy Fortunate is not the same thing as like a name like Margaret Cavendish. These names are allegorical. In other words, the characters are precisely what their names describe. Lady Happy Fortunate, for example, is fortunate because of who she is, good fortune has smiled upon her to be a person of good standing, good social standing and economic standing in her place. Um, right, a fortune. Someone like Monsieur Take Pleasure might enjoy it, but also you might think a little bit more about removing it, and so on and so forth. I bet you can figure out a lot of them if you just look at the character list at the beginning of the play. And by the way, you might notice that there's a fellow named Dick in there. And, no, and just to be clear, that doesn't mean what you think it means uh, back in the 17th century. It just means an everyman. A diminutive is often used for a child or for a person of the lower class at this time. So rather than Richard, he gets Dick, which is a diminutive of that name. Um, it means that other thing in the 1890s, but this isn't the 1890s. So just wanted to clear that one up. All right, so... Our Duchess of Newcastle, 
Um, please remember, just as, as part of your regular reading practice, to give some time to the biographical entries that the editors give you at the beginning of every selection that we have. They're well worth reading to get a sense of who these people are and their world. One of the effects that we can have oftentimes with literature that's so long ago and far away is it gets what the writer Jeanette Winterson refers to as the modern books treatment. In other words, we look at this picture of this woman on the screen and we say it's a portrait of someone from long ago. It must be boring. Maybe so. But Think about it this way instead. If you get a little sense of who they are and who their lives are, you can start to understand them not as these great figures that you must show respect to, but rather these people who confronted a world that was complicated and a world that asked them to use their intellectual, emotional, critical, philosophical faculties to be able to deal with the problems and issues that they have. A lot of the issues that Cavendish is dealing with in 17th century England will be unfamiliar to us. But I think, especially as you see as this PowerPoint goes on, I think you'll find a lot of the things that she does, for better or worse, still resonate with us today, particularly the oppression of women under a patriarchal society. So she's very important to the Restoration because she writes far more passionately than a lot of other writers of the time. She also has a large range of interests. She likes writing about science. She writes um, a text called The Blazing World. Maybe you might sometimes run into that in another class somewhere that a lot of people view as sort of a prototype for science fiction. It's really interesting, but it's also very long um, compared to Convent of Pleasure. So um, she was born into a rich family, lucky her. She was the youngest of eight. Um, her father died when she was two, I believe, and she was raised by her mother. Um, and so that gave her this role model for being a strong and independent woman. Um, she received no education beyond rudimentary reading and writing skills, which was better than a lot of women got um, at the time. But still, from such humble beginnings, not humble economically, but humble in terms of education afforded to women, she goes on to become an important author. That's fantastic. Um, she took the side of the king in the English Civil War. Probably a good idea, but it didn't turn out to be because, as you've learned looking at history, Charles I loses the war to Oliver Cromwell and the Puritans, the Roundheads, the Cavaliers. So, um, the Roundheads defeat the Cavaliers. Anyway, so Margaret was a maid of honor in Queen Henrietta Maria's court. That's Charles I's wife. Uh, and she followed her into exile in Paris in 1644. While she was there, she met a 52-year-old guy named William Cavendish, uh, and they got married. She was 22 years old. Yeah, if you think that's a bit ick, it's, yeah, probably. Uh, it also means you're probably not a Hollywood casting agent. Good for you. Um, with the defeat of Charles I in 1649, William, her husband's lands were confiscated, and the couple lived in impoverished exile because aristocrats are known for having land to be rich. If they don't have land, they don't have much. So, but while they were in Paris and uh, poor, disenfranchised um Nobles, they did get to meet uh, philosophers such as Thomas Hobbes, who wrote Leviathan, which is a treatise on the importance of monarchy to stop dictatorships. In other words, how a good monarch can keep someone like Oliver Cromwell from coming to power. And Rene Descartes, after all, for the famous cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, right? One of the founding um, thinkers in the history of rationalism. So, um... The, she petitions um, the current government for reparations on the loss of William's land. She doesn't get those, but during those years while she's in England, she begins to write. And from that, we very quickly get a number of texts that she starts publishing. And she doesn't write about love. She writes about science, politics, and morality. She also does something absolutely outrageous. She publishes. Gasp. She publishes under her own name at that. Now, a lot of authors through the 19th century, Isaac Dennison, um, George Eliot was Marianne Evans. You have all of these female writers who would write under male names or use initials, such as our author of Harry Potter, right, to hide their gender. For Margaret Cavendish to publish as Margaret Cavendish is outrageous for a woman to do that at the time. And for several centuries afterwards, it will still cause scandals and oftentimes backlash. And also for her class position, because after all, um, 
The aristocrats often don't like associating with the commoners out there, now do they? So um, to publish is to be part of that. She also um, cross-dressed. She wore men's waistcoats and hats and preferred to bow rather than curtsy. Um, she seemed unfazed by this, which is awesome, and continued writing until her death. Um, they were named Duke and Duchess of Newcastle once Charles II was restored to the English throne. So, as you, as you know then, women in the 1700s, she was in the end of the 1600s, of course, no formal education, and they were segregated out of conversations of intellectual and social issues. That is from rational debate. But reason and rationality, one of the most radical things that gets put forth about that, is that it is not gendered. According to Descartes, a mind, humanity, human beings are capable of being rational. It is not confined to being male or female. So, in this time, and into the 19th century, especially over the 18th, the public sphere steps up. One of the things that I sometimes teach, maybe you're in a class where I am teaching that, maybe not, uh, is Dryden's poem Absalom and Achitophel. It is, a, in, it is a political allegory run through biblical stories. Poetry doesn't function like that after that time, right? But the public sphere is a place for these political and cultural discussions. Poetry could be part of it. Newspapers become key to it. However, it's almost entirely the domain of adult European men who are literate. The private sphere is where domestics, servants, and the likes. Um, it's also the personal realm and the domain of women and children. So men exist primarily in the public sphere, women in the private. And we still see how the the legacy of that lasts because the legacy lasts. That's articulate. Anyway, I'm not going to edit it. Um, that women don't get paid equally for doing the same amount of work because there still is this belief that women don't need to earn money for themselves, right? They're often supplementing some bread earning male or something like that. This is where these ideas come from, the public sphere and the private sphere, and that they get gendered. So that way, if you know the, the feminist slogan, the personal is political, right? Um, that gives some of the context for that statement. After all, if you're being confined to the private world, that is political. So, a few other things we should know, just to sort of disambiguate our terms. Virtue is a term we mostly associate with sexual mores. At least that would be the way I would think about it, right? Someone is virtuous or not. Uh, maybe just ethically they're virtuous. But in the 17th century, when she's writing, they use the term to suggest a civic as well as personal qualities, right? In other words, public and private, you might say, come through virtue in that way. Um, and you're going to see how this becomes an argument for why women should be part of the public sphere, right? Um, civil society at the time, and, you know, ideally civil society seeks to improve one another through conversation. And mediation, right? The role in the play, performed by Mata Mediator, illustrates how rational and intellectual culture can bridge those differences in a class society. I apologize for the extra spaces in between some words there. My Macintosh keyboard is acting up. Um, moderation as well. Um, B is valuable because the English are trying to heal a society riven by a civil war, right? The last time they were really at each other's throats, that's what it turned into. The king got beheaded. So maybe we should try to, you know, work a little bit harder to keep ourselves from falling into warfare again. And they do succeed. So in all of this, gender becomes crucial because virtue and consent are things that are lived by women in their private lives as well as in their public lives. And just a little bit into the future, a century later, so in the 18th century, which we're still studying, Cavendish's great-granddaughter, the Duchess of Portland, meets a young girl from the gentry that's not lower class, not upper class, kind of in the middle there, named Elizabeth Montague. Elizabeth Montague is a very important name in the history of journal writing and in the intellectual history of Shakespeare studies and the blue stocking circles, which maybe we'll talk about a little bit more later, but at least you've heard about here. So she gets treated as an equal, uh, the young Elizabeth Montague, and she indeed becomes this intellectual leading light. Um, the blue stocking circle is mostly, but not exclusively, women. Um, it actually originally refers to cheap socks, um, which is funny a little bit in this context, because after all, Cromwell was the guy beheading and making miserable the Duchess of Portland's grandmother, 
the Duchess of Newcastle. So uh, Montague ends up providing a key defense of Shakespeare and writing in vernacular, in other words, in English, during the neoclassical, which was, after all, all about Greek and Roman precedents, the three unities, which Shakespeare doesn't follow, right? He doesn't follow unities of, of, of time, place, and action. He's all over the place, and it's wonderful, right? Women didn't get a classical education, so reading in the vernacular is what they had. And guess what? That's also what the common people had. People like you and I, I don't know if, if anyone in the class should be addressed as his or her lordship. I don't think so. Me neither. We wouldn't have gotten that education. Chances are we probably still don't have it. You know, maybe we might know a smattering of Greek. Maybe you've taken Latin. Maybe you did some of that in high school, what have you. But in the main, we read in English, right? So we owe female intellectual tradition, really, for the growth of Shakespeare studies, English departments, and reading in the vernacular. Elizabeth Montague, absolutely crucial to that. And how did she get to be an important person in 18th century society? Margaret Cavendish's granddaughter. Cool, huh? All right. I'm going to pause for a second. Um, a lot of times I bullet point all of these things, but, you know, you can probably cope. And pictures. Pictures are good, aren't they? All right. So secular spirituality, as I mentioned before, the convent of pleasure. So a couple of things to think about. A salon... You might know from the internet site, perhaps, uh, is a place of rational discussion. It's a French model. Um, and always in those, they were single gender, all women or all men. A convent, as we, as we probably know, right, is a religious retreat. And also, most often, all women or all men, right? Um, these were early models for the Blue Stocking Club and for female colleges. So guess what? Convent of Pleasure might sound odd, but if you start to think about it as a place for female education, and women being able to share their experience in a safe space that does not involve men around it. I mean, we have colleges in Massachusetts, highly prestigious colleges that are still all women's colleges, right? These become models. So Cavendish, in some ways, is imagining something that doesn't exist yet, but that becomes quite standard by the late 19th and 20th centuries. So um, pleasure might suggest sexual feelings, and I think there absolutely is an erotic dimension to this text. I'm not going to focus on that too much here. I figure if you want to go with that, that's what the discussion board is for. Um, but also aesthetic points too, right? We get pleasure from things that are aesthetically pleasing. So the focus on interior design that she does in Act 2, Scene 2, which might strike you as why is she spending so much time talking about, um, the quality of linens and pillows and changing with the changing the drapes and things with the seasons, because those are signifiers of polite society. They're an indicator that she can use her intellect and her rationality to show her taste. It's very important to show Lady Happy Happy's class position to be able to help convey those ideas as possible to an audience of nobles. Right. So um, I mentioned before the utopian writing tradition, this rhetoric of potential ideal worlds. Uh, in, in English intellectual tradition, Thomas More's Utopia is where most of these writers are looking back to. So she takes a Catholic architecture, right? Nuns and convents and puts it within a literary landscape, right? This creation of this woman inherits, inherits a sum of money and decides to make a secular convent based on pleasure. She doesn't have a better term than convent because that's the only model she can find out there. And she uses that to interrogate women's very limited roles in Protestant society. And if you think about it, that's really a staggering intellectual juxtaposition when you put all of those things in a row like that. Also, she relies upon reasoned argument to say why she doesn't need the social rituals of marriage courtship, childbearing, or even having men around at all. And she also seeks to conduct charity, right, to help out people less fortunate than herself because it will provide the greatest good for the greatest numbers. Also, be aware of what women's very limited options are at this time. Marriage, the monastery, becoming nuns, actual nuns, uh, the street, um, maybe going out with gypsies, the theater, um, those sorts of things. This is more relevant to maybe what upper and middle class women can do than lower class. Lower class women, servitude is going to be the order of the day. Um, and the idea of being able to raise oneself up through the social order, we'll see more when we start reading texts by, say, Samuel Pepys, as he's a really good example of that. So, uh, 
Therefore, some big themes in the Convent of Pleasure that you might see are issues of choice and consent, and these are still issues today. Um, the intellectual, social, and erotic potential, too, of all female communities. Um, and this text will, and this model will, of course, upset Protestants and Catholics alike. Huzzah! Um, if you think this is really cool and you want to read an in-depth academic article on that, here is a citation for you. You can go looking in some of the academic databases that Fitchburg State provides to you to find that article. It's from Women's Studies and it came out in 2009. It's quite interesting and it's informing a number of the ideas that I'm sharing with you here in this, power, in this uh, lecture. So, how about comedy? The full title... The, con a, the Convent of Pleasure, colon, a comedy. So comedy, we often think of as sort of, you know, slapstick farce type stuff, but it's often, in its older forms, a genre of inversion and subversion, right? Fools get to be kings, kings get to be fools, down is up, right? Women can, women can take on jobs that men usually do. After all, Lady Happy has female apothecaries, whatever shall we do, right? I mean, it's laughable to us now that this would be shocking, but think about the difference between their world and ours. And then also think about income inequality, and maybe, just maybe, some of these ideas that she's railing against here, in a very, I think, gentle, gentle and, and uh, light-handed manner, still plague us. So, so the goal of the con uh, Convent of Pleasure, you might read as woman decides to set out, set up an all-female society, men infiltrate it, she falls in love with one, and ha, her folly is shown, and she is corrected. I mean, you can read it that way if you want. I think that's a pretty depressing uh, rendition of the text. However, if you think about it, are the people transformed and changed by what they go through? Comedy has to. If you think about something like Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, they go into the green world, right? Oberon and Titania, and they're, and they're there. And when they come back to court, to the city, they're changed by the experience. The importance of this is not just diversion, but rather that hopefully from this, the men and the women and the audience especially have been changed by the imagining of the world a different way. That's the subversive quality. Don't get too hung up on endings in things like this. Take a look at the middle. It's one of the tricks in narrative, right? Beginnings incite desire. Endings have to sort everything out in a way that makes sense to us in a way that is both emotionally satisfying, intellectually satisfying, and makes sense while still being a little bit surprising. In the middle, though, all those spaces in between, that's where authors get to do anything and everything. And that's most often where you'll find those subversive moments. So if you're looking for that sort of potential and you feel like, oh, Cavendish really sold me out in that last act, maybe she did. But don't neglect all the things she put in between. That's where the really good, interesting stuff happens. Right. So, um, so that really is the question. I think you'll also find this or something like it for your discussion question this week is, how does, say, even cross-dressing change, right? Because if you have to imagine the world from a different viewpoint, right, from a different gender position, you'll often find yourself thinking about things that you wouldn't recognize otherwise. And maybe we can find somewhere in the text evidence of these sorts of changes. All right, something that confuses students a lot when they run into this is in Act 3. We're reading a play, and all of a sudden, whoa, they start putting on a play. Now, if you've read Hamlet, you've seen this happen before, right? But Hamlet's not the only place where this happens. So early on, um, a few things that are going on. So mostly the plays within a play, right, take all the troubles women have in the outside world at the time, and they reintroduce them to the convent. But they don't reintroduce them in a way that becomes triggering or traumatic for them, it gives the women the opportunity to control and illustrate what their lives are like, all right? So when Lady Happy says, I will not be so enslaved because men make female sex their slaves, this is a liberatory process. Being able to control art, right? Female directors, female producers, female owners, right? All these things where women are able to be in control of things offers their perspective. 
right? So in this way, right, being able to address the ills that women face in the outside world in the safe space of the convent manages to serve as catharsis, which is a great literary term, which if you don't know, it's how you, it's that emotional response you have through art, right? Maybe you cry at movies or you like watching horror movies because it's fun to be scared, whatever it might be, you're going through representations that allow you to have real emotions. Aristotle writes about this, um, and this is one of the key things about for him about tragedy. In this case, comedy, though, can also do that, right? And in these moments, I ask you to consider in the plays within a plays, is this quote unquote comedy? I would dare say it's social commentary. So, um, maybe I'm stretching it a little bit too far, but trying to make some connections since 2014 or so, we've been seeing a lot of social media campaigns that help to raise understanding about issues of misogyny and violence towards women, such as, uh, with the hashtag yes, all women and the me too campaign after Harvey Weinstein's, um, hideousness. Um, and you do know about these things, I'm assuming, but in case you don't, I'm going to cautiously uh, offer Wikipedia to you. Um, they have plenty of sources. I believe the Me Too movement uh, article has like close to 400 citations in it. And the Yes All Women, I think, is 30 or 40. So Wikipedia can be helpful as just a starting point for things. Um, and since it is, after all, contemporary. But if you're unfamiliar with what I'm talking about, because um, you don't pay any attention to social media, um, what I mean by that, you could follow those links and find out what I mean. Do you think it's relevant? Maybe. I mean, it's the 17th century. This is the 21st. There are some differences, but I think when you think about the importance of raising issues that women go through in society and being able to say these are valid concerns, I think there's some similarity on those very, very basic levels. So there also is a point where everybody dresses up as shepherds, and that's an odd one for students. Let me tell you about that. That's the genre called the pastoral. Um, in the Restoration or early modern, the period that precedes uh, the Restoration in the 18th century, it's very common for courtly society kings and queens to dress up as shepherds to be able to basically pretend to be peasants and talk about their society and their world as though they're not these cynical, intensely political types, right? Pastoral also has a poetic tradition of depicting the woes of rural hardship. Sometimes that gets referred to as counter-pastoral or anti-pastoral, sometimes just as pastoral. Um, oftentimes, if you're reading a text about countryside or sheep or things like that, it can become difficult to figure out. I don't think this is the case of that, but sometimes it's difficult to figure out whether or not it's in this sort of praise of landowners, which is where the pastorals and Georgics began in the, in the classical period in in Greece, um, or whether or not they're being critical. And it's those sorts of ambivalent moments that are really interesting. Um, this pastoral section is also some of the bits where the play is written by, as she calls him, my Lord Duke, her husband, the Duke of Newcastle. So not only do men infiltrate the convent in the text, a man also shows up to write portions of her text. Um, throughout the semester, keep an, uh, keep an eye out for sheep and shepherds and rural labor. Um, you might remember the solitary reaper. Um, depictions of rural labor are most frequently referred to as Georgic. That's a small distinction there, but an important one. Um, you might note the cover of the book. After all, shows a bunch of people loading hay onto a wagon. There's some rural labor being depicted right there. So um, before... We close here, because like I said, I don't want this to go on for too long. Um, I do want to give you, though, just a close reading of just one section. I think there's a fascinating monologue. There are many, many, many fascinating monologues uh, in the text. But I want to uh, call your attention to one of the early ones from Lady Happy around Act 1, Scene 2. Within those, I want to call attention to three things I find remarkable. Again, this is not everything you should ever know about the text, but let's just, let's pick a few things, uh, and then you guys can show me what you can do. Uh, a couple of lines deal with imagination. A few lines deal with issues of consent, political and personal, that I've been mentioning throughout this um, lecture here, and something about the rhetoric of moderation, which I also mentioned earlier. So, let's proceed, shall we? The line about imagination strikes my uh, 
fancy, if you will. It's only the imagination doth frighten the soul into active zeal. The brackets there indicate that I've dropped those in there. That was the, uh, uh, the actual line includes it. The it refers to the soul earlier in the sentence. So that's what you can do there sometimes if you need to drop in a proper noun where the author has written a pronoun. So, only the imagination doth frighten the soul into active zeal. That activity, I think, is really important. Um, this is something that we'd often associate with talk about the power of the poetic imagination to help us to imagine. Uh, as you'll see with writers like Wordsworth, he oftentimes finds that just being able to go look at a tree is actually inferior to a poet's ability to use dots on a page, right? Lines, letters, you know, all these things to conjure in our minds an image of one, right? In other words, being able to imagine a thing can oftentimes be better than the thing itself, right? Now, Cavendish doesn't quite do that, but I think she's beginning to suggest that the imagination is capable of inspiring and transforming the person who's doing the imagining. And this is a moment where she goes beyond her usual sort of rational, we are thinking through these things. Because after all, imagination is not always about rationality, right? In fact, a lot of people put it right up against that, right? It's the opposite of that. Rather, I'd say it's more the power of emotions to sway and motivate us. And those things are really crucial. After all, if you think about rhetoric, right? You have to use reason, right? If we're trying to persuade someone, you need reason. You need to be able to offer you know, emotional content, pathos, be able to talk to, to those people about their concerns. And you also need to be ethical, right? You need to be a good source and be able to make a good argument for something. You need all of these things together. So the fact that she's drawing on imagination in these moments, particularly as a religious moment, I find just a, a fascinating bit of a divergence from her, um, from her usual very very rational and precise and more scientific uh, ways of thinking. Uh, and part of the why this is remarkable is because Freud is still a long way off. So, um, on the issue of consent, both political and personal, I draw your attention to the lines between 101 and 104. And what creature that has reason or rational understanding would serve cruel masters when they might serve a kind mistress? or would forsake the service of their kind mistress to serve cruel masters? Lady Happy asks. So what I would say about that is that this is showing that consent is rational. And rationality, remember, is a product of human beings. The social contract then asks people who are ruling to behave a certain way, right? And that also means that maybe a monarchy where somebody's just born into it doesn't really work quite as well as being able to choose who your ruler is, right? This would also apply in the personal sense that two people who are romantically in love with each other, maybe they should be able to marry. And if somebody's cruel, maybe you don't have to stay with them, right? These are amazing ideas. Still, you know, in some in some cases, still quite revolutionary, right? And notice as well how she quite unsubtly um, associates master with cruelty and mistress with kindness. I th I like it. Um, recall as well that England has had a queen ruling without a king before, so the idea of women being in power is less foreign to them than we might think it is. Um, so just keep in mind, rulers have the obligation to be kind, and they have to seek out consent. Because Charles II must rule in conjunction with a parliament, he does not get to enjoy that sort of absolute monarchy that his father had. That's important, and this is one of the ways that a writer is able to explore these issues in the court of Charles II in a way they could not in the court of Charles I. So, also, Madame Mediator, a bit later on in Act Two. Uh, mentions that being in the company of the women in the convent gave her as much pleasure as any absolute monarch, which is amazing as a statement, right? So collective identity being part of this group of women manages for her to be as powerful as she could imagine absolute authority is. And how different are those things? In one of them, one person utterly dominates everyone else. In the one though Madame Mediator is talking about, everyone is together and find some sort of collective pleasure in that. It's not about power, 
that it could be. So, and remember, if this is a royalist, somebody who supports the king. And she's a woman, and it's 1688. I think it's pretty cool. All right. Last one, or the third of three. Freely please ourselves in that which is best for us, and that which is best, what is most temperately used. So in other words, we please ourselves by our serving our own self-interest, what is best for us, right? Do things that are good for you. And what's best is to do things in moderation, right? Sounds like you're getting dietary advice, doesn't it, right? Don't eat too much of that. You can have a little bit of fun, but not too much fun, right? A little bit of peril, not too much peril, right? Um, so to remind, near the beginning of the PowerPoint, I wrote that moderation is valuable because the English are trying to heal a society riven by civil war. This is true. But also, moderation and self-interest come to typify the middle class in the coming centuries, right? And she's trying to strike a balance here that's actually quite difficult. The balance between freedom and fairness, right? Liberté, égalité, fraternité, liberty, equality, and brotherhood. I wonder the French Revolution didn't work out. First off, liberty and equality, really difficult. And brotherhood, you left out half the population, guys. <sighs> so disappointing. Anyway, freely praised, temperately used. We, we, there ha there's this assumption then of restraint, right? There has to be some level of regulation. And that's what polite society tries to teach. This is the emerging ideology of the bourgeoisie. There is so much more in the Convent of Pleasure that I'm going to leave up to you to discover and you to tell me about in the discussion board. There's a quiz for you, all sorts of fun things. Um, I think this should be a good start in getting you guys going in that. You know, learned a little bit about her. I answered some of the really big, broad questions about how the play works itself out and gave you an example of a few things that I'm looking for when I'm reading Cavendish. And these, of course, are big themes that you can look for in the text as well. Trust me. They don't occur just there in that one act. They're all over the place. So try to look for some of those little points. And, you know, maybe you'll find Cavendish an uh, inspiring writer and you'll want to write about her for your, first, uh, for your first essay even. So I will leave us with that. And that will do it. Thank you much for listening. And bye-bye. <laughs>